distinguished guests joining us this evening. Now, when we call your name, please stand to be recognized. Lieutenant Governor Dennis Dugard. <laughs> Senator Stanford Adelstein. <laughs> Dr. Jack Warner, Executive Director and CEO of the South Dakota Board of Regents. Board of Regents System Vice President of Research, Gary Johnson. Regent Kathy Johnson. Former School Alliance President and First Lady, Dr. Richard and Nancy Gowan. and the members of the South Dakota Science and Technology Authority who are in attendance this evening. And we also recognize members of the South Dakota, South Dakota School of Mines and Technologies University Advisory Board. And importantly, let us also recognize the First Lady of the School of Mines, Dr. Carolyn Fossey Wharton. In addition to our guests, we extend a heartfelt thank you to all the sponsors who have helped to make this event so successful. Major sponsors include a generous anonymous donor, Architecture Incorporated, Dr. Richard and Nancy Cowan, The Hard Rock Club, and Hard Rock Marketing, KEPN, Black Hills Fox, The Rapid City Journal, Simpsons Printing, as well as many others who have contributed in various ways at multiple levels. A list of sponsors may be found in your program. We would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the committee members who have worked so hard to make this event a success. Please stand to be recognized when your committee is announced. Members of the Mines of Metal Technical Review and Selection Committees. The Mines Medal Award Ceremony Planning Committee. The Mines Medal Silent Auction Committee. Thank you to each and every one of you for your efforts. The Mines Medal was established by School of Mines President Robert A. Wharton to bring recognition to engineers and scientists to explore new frontiers to acquire knowledge to benefit society. President Wharton joined the School of Mines on July 1, 2008 as the university's 18th president. Since his arrival, he's led the institution along a continuous path of quality improvement, securing resources during a $50 million capital campaign, and optimizing enrollment with higher admission standards and much needed growth. He's championed the university's leadership role in developing the Deep Underground Science and Engineering Laboratory in Leeds, South Dakota, while tripling annual research funding in the School of Mines to $35 million. President Wharton is a recipient and honoree of several distinguished awards and recognitions. President Wharton is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and is currently advising the Secretary of Energy as an appointee to the National Coal Council. He is a member of the Council on Competitiveness and serves on the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities Energy Advisory Committee. President Wharton is also actively involved in Rapid City Area Community through membership on the Economic Development Partnership and Chamber of Commerce Boards. Please join me in welcoming School of Mines President Robert A. Wharton. Well, thank you, Jack and Julie, for the kind introduction. And Thank all of you for being with us this evening. By paying tribute to outstanding engineers and scientists, we demonstrate to the students of tomorrow, and especially our students at the School of Mines, that they too can be leaders and innovators. Highlighting the significant role of engineers and scientists and the role that they play in our society gives us an opportunity to emphasize the importance of leadership in areas 
that have the power to change the world. And speaking of students, I would like to ask our wine students here this evening to please stand. Let's give them a round of applause. Look at this. Let's also thank the faculty that are here this evening. This is why we appreciate your support so much. For you are investing in their futures and creating a brighter future for all of us. Thank you. As president of a university focused on engineering and science, I believe that leadership in these areas of endeavor and knowledge discovery are vital to our nation's success. I also believe that it is incumbent upon us to bring recognition to those who explore the frontiers of science and contribute to resolving our scientific and technological challenges. This evening, we honor a leader whose brilliant achievements in engineering and science have set him apart. We will hear more about Dr. Squires later in our program. In addition to honoring a leader in science or engineering, the Mines Medal allows us to assist our best and brightest students in pursuing research at the School of Mines. Your presence here tonight and your support of this event funds the Mines Medal Graduate Student Fellowship. This evening, we are proud to recognize Ms. Erin Hamburg. She is the very first recipient of the fellowship. Ms. Hamburg is pursuing a PhD in nanoscience and nanoengineering, as well as a master's degree in physics. A native of Del Rapids, South Dakota, she graduated from the School of Mines in December 2006 with bachelor's, bachelor's degrees in computer science and applied and computational mathematics. While working as a research assistant at the John T. Kurovich Cancer Care Institute, she developed an interest in physics and decided to attend the School of Mines. Ms. Hamburg is engaged in research with her advisor, Dr. Andre Petikoff, to develop a theoretical model for a quantum computer. More about her research is noted in your program. After receiving her doctorate, Ms. Hamburg plans to seek a physics faculty position and to extend her, extend her research into other areas of quantum com computation. Please join me in welcoming the 2010 Mines Medal Fellowship recipient, Ms. Erin Ms. Erin Hamburg. Erin, would you please join me on the stage? Congratulations, Ms. Amber. On behalf of the School of Mines, we wish you continued success in pursuing your research endeavors and your degrees. of the Mines Medal Award, the Mines Medal is presented by the Governor of South Dakota. Though he is not able to be with us this evening, I would like to thank Governor Michael Rounds for his support of the Mines Medal. Representing Governor Rounds and to present the second annual Mines Medal Award, we are pleased to have with us Lieutenant Governor Dennis Dugard. Received a bachelor's degree from the University of South Dakota in political science and a juris doctor from Northwestern University in Chicago. And he became involved in politics in 1996 when he was elected to the South Dakota State Senate. He was re-elected for two terms and in the summer of 2002 was nominated as candidate for lieutenant governor. And so please join me in officially welcoming, welcoming Lieutenant Governor Dennis Dugard.
Thank you, Bob. I guess I jumped the gun coming to the stage. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wharton, and thank you to all of you that are here tonight. It is a beautiful night, and I guess I'm a little surprised at that because uh, I was here last year to present the Mayans Award, and I had the idea that it would be a bad weather night because I remember Dr. Wharton saying something last year about uh, it would be a cold day before I would be back at the Lions Medal presentation. So I was a little surprised at the weather, but it's very nice to be here. I'm glad to be here among so many scientists. Uh, I'm sure there are many scientific disciplines here tonight, engineering, chemistry, biology. I myself am a political scientist. It's glad to be, good to be among my peers. And, <laughs> I want to say congratulations to Aaron Hanberg. Uh, I was especially attracted to the uh, choice because Aaron's from my hometown, Del Rapids. So congratulations to Aaron, and Aaron's dad is here, and uh, several of his buttons hit me in the eye. And, uh, but congratulations, Aaron. Uh, it's good to be here with uh, faculty, students, and staff of the School of Mines. I was glad to see so many students here tonight. Not every university offers such excellent education. I know one family whose son attended a lesser school in another state, and this son's, or this couple's sons graduated from college and was living at home, and this was distressing to his mother who felt he should get out and get a job, and she was urging her husband to get him out and get a job. And, and, uh, she kept pestering her husband, and, and he tried to calm her down, and he said, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a little experiment. We need science ourselves, and I'm going to set a $20 bill on the table and a Bible and a fifth of whiskey, and then we're going to go out to dinner. And, and so we can help our son choose the right path. If he chooses the $20 bill, we know he'll be a businessman. We can point him down that track. If he chooses the Bible, we know he'll be a counselor or a minister. We'll send him down that track. And if he chooses the bottle of whiskey, oh, woe is us, he's going to be a drunkard. So they went out to dinner, and, and as they approached the ho house, the mother said, I can't go in. You're going to have to go in and, and see what happened. Father went in, and he came back out, and he said, well, here's the news. He picked all three, the money, the Bible, and the whiskey. He's apparently going to be a politician. So, <laughs> You know, science is about finding answers, and sometimes it takes more than science to find the right answer to a question. I'm reminded of the train conductor who was summoned to a train compartment where two passengers were in loud disagreement. One said, if the window is open, I shall catch cold and shall certainly die. And the other one said, if the window is not open, I am going to suffocate. And the two glared at each other. And the Conductor was at a loss. He didn't know what to do. Till uh, an annoyed passenger who was sitting nearby said, First open the window, that'll kill the one, then shut it, that'll kill the other, then we'll have some peace. <laughs> you know, many of you know I'm a native South Dakotan, except for a short period when I was away at school and for a little bit of work afterwards. I've lived in South Dakota all my life, and I'm proud of South Dakota. I think we have a great state. A lot of things are going well. I'm proud of our education system, too. Our grade schools and our high schools and our universities. We have much to celebrate. We have good teachers. We have good parents who send their students to the classroom door generally prepared. In some states, that's less true. Uh, among states that measure at least half their students, we have the fifth highest ACT score in the nation. Our graduation rate from high school is about 10% above the national average. And once those students graduate, we rank in the top five routinely for those who go on for post-secondary school. But even though South Dakota does well in comparison to our sister states, we share a problem with our sister states, and that is our nation lags other developed countries in achievement in science and math. Our students pursue higher education in other areas, social science, much more so than in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we need to do something about that. We need to encourage our high schools to emphasize science and math. 
We need to find ways to pay teachers more in those areas. We need to take advantage of our virtual high school where we can get the best teachers. And we need to find uh, ways to teach our students that are at times convenient to them, not necessarily convenient to us. South Dakota is feeling the effects of the national recession, certainly, but we're doing better than most. And part of that is because of science and technology, science and engineering. Our agricultural economy is stronger because plant science has pushed corn and soybean productions to new heights. I can remember driving down the highway with my wife, Linda, and remarking at dry land corn west of Wall. Unheard of. Our manufacturing sector has added jobs when most of the nation has lost manufacturing jobs. And part of that is because of advanced engineering like friction stir welding, like laser deposition welding and robotics. Sometimes the opportunities are so good they come to us, like last Monday when Caterpillar established the Black Hills Engineering and Design Center here in Rapid City so they could get the benefit of the School of Mine graduates and our Western Dakota Tech graduates and the skills and the talents that they have. Instead of trying to drag them to Peoria, they brought Peoria to South Dakota in their design center. One of the concerns we often hear in South Dakota is that we're exporting our most valuable resource, our young people. But here we're bringing opportunity to them, keeping them right here at home. Science and engineering will be vitally important to keeping our state economy strong, and we must encourage our students to pursue careers in science and engineering to maintain our strength. One of the ways, one of the important ways that we encourage our students is by recognizing and holding up examples of excellence in these fields. That's why tonight we gather to honor the 2010 Mines Medalist, a scientist who has taken us to the surface of Mars and in the process enthused and enlightened young and old alike throughout the world to the importance and joys of scientific discovery and engineering accomplishment. On behalf of Governor Rounds and the state of South Dakota, I want to congratulate Dr. Stephen Squires and also present a special proclamation Thursday, October 28, 2010, is hereby designated Stephen W. Squires Day in the state of South Dakota. It's your day, Dr. Squires. <laughs> Stephen W. Squires. Dr. Squires is the Goldwyn Smith Professor of Astronomy at Cornell University and the principal investigator for the science payload on NASA's Mars Exploration Rover Project. Dr. Squires successfully conceived, organized, and led the exploration of the planet Mars with two small rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. He is also a co-investigator on the Mars Express mission and on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-resolution imaging science experiment. Dr. Squires' research focuses on the large, solid bodies of the solar system terrestrial planets and the satellites of the Jovian planets. His work involves analysis of data from both spacecraft and ground-based telescopes, as well as geophysical modeling. His area of particular interest includes the tectonics of Venus, the history of water on Mars, and the geophysics of the icy satellites of the outer planets. Dr. Squires has participated in a number of planetary spaceflight missions. From 1978 to 1981, he was an associate of the Voyager Imaging Science Team, participating in analysis of imaging data from the encounters with Jupiter and Saturn. He was a radar investigator on the Magellan mission to Venus a member of the Mars Observer Gamma Ray Spectrometer Flight Investigation Team and a co-investigator on the Russian Mars 1996 mission. While much of Dr. Squire's NASA work has centered on Mars, his ground-based research focuses on geophysical modeling of all the planets, as well as some large moons. 
in an effort to understand the geological forces at work on these distant planetary bodies. He's also conducted field work in Antarctica, er, studying the perennially ice-covered lakes in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. I was talking with Dr. Squires uh, and Dr. Wharton, who have scuba dived in those icy waters, and they were talking about how the water and the cold gets through their gloves no matter what you do. So uh, he's been where no man has gone before, probably. He served as the chair of the NASA Space Science Advisory Committee and as a member of the NASA Advisory Council. In addition, Dr. Squires is a member of the imaging team for the Cassini mission to Saturn. Dr. Squires has written numerous scientific articles in the field of planetary sciences and in 2005 published the popular book, Roving Mars, Spirit, Opportunity, and the Exploration of the Red Planet. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Dr. Stephen Squires. Dr. Squires. Florida. It shows the rover Spirit in the foreground, all tricked out, ready to go to Mars. 
opportunity is in the background against the firewall, it doesn't have reels on yet, and I'm a good looking guy in a white suit. Um, and these rovers are our surrogates, and we experience Mars through their eyes. Let me start with the Spirit rover mission. The landing site for Spirit is that great big blue crater that you see in the middle of that scene there. It's about 100 miles in diameter. The reason we chose that as a landing site is that if you look to the south of it, there's a big dried up riverbed flowing into the crater. I mean, it's a big hole in the ground with a dry river. There had to have been a lake at there at one point in the past. So we landed and we saw this. And I managed to convince myself for, oh, maybe two or three days that this is what a Martian dry lake bed should look like. Then we looked at the rocks. This is the first rock we looked at in detail. We named it Adirondack. It's about this big. And we hit it with everything we had. This thing is not a sedimentary rock at all. It's a piece of lava. And every rock for miles in every direction was lava too. Mars faked this out here. I'm sure those sediments are down there someplace, but they've been covered by lava. And we couldn't get at it. So initially, this was a bitter disappointment. Now, the rovers were designed to last for 90 days and to drive about 600 yards over their lifetime. Um, about a mile and a half to the southeast, there was this marvelous range of hills that we named the Columbia Hills after the Columbia Space Shuttle. And realizing that there was nothing but lava as far as the eye could see everywhere else, we decided to sprint rover speed to the Columbia Hills. On day 156 of our 90 day mission, we reached the base of the highest hill. Uh, we named this one Husband Hill. It's named after Rick Husband, who was the commander of the Columbia when it went down. And we climbed it all the way to the top. Uh, as we worked our way up the hill, we started to see very different sorts of rocks. These pictures were taken with our microscope. They're only about a half, they're only about an inch across. And now you can see fine layering rocks. Now we started to see the kinds of minerals that can only form in the presence of water. We got to the summit of a mountain as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Uh, about 600 days of climbing this thing, doing the first ever mountaineering on Mars. Like any good mountaineer, we took a, a picture when we got to the summit. This is the view looking off to the south. And as we speak right now, the Spirit Rover is right there, hibernating, ho hoping, we hope, surviving its fourth winter on the surface of Mars. Now, Spirit has had a rough time. Uh, one thing that happened was about 800 days into the mission, the right front wheel failed. And so now when we drive Spirit, we have to drive the vehicle backwards, dragging that dead wheel through the soil. But there's a wonderful silver lining for this. We were driving the rover one day through a narrow little valley in the trench that's dug by the wheel. The bottom of the trench, one day, the, the, the soil in this valley turned up as bright as white snow. It's caught our attention. We went over and measured the composition. It's not snow at all. It's 90% pure silica. This is not quartz. It's not beach sand. This is like opal, like the gemstone. This is the kind of stuff that forms in hot springs. So this represents a former, the silica deposit in this little valley represents a former hot spring environment on Mars, a place where life would thrive. Of course, we named this place Silica Valley. <laughs> the other way in which Spirit has had a tough time is the dust. This is a self-portrait the rover took about 300 days into the mission. There's a lot of dust in the Martian atmosphere, and it settles out, and it just coats everything. And you can see the solar arrays are brown. Now, when this vehicle was brand new, straight off the showroom floor, those solar arrays would put out about 900 watt hours of power per day. That's enough energy to run a 100 watt light bulb for nine hours. For, for, uh, for nine hours. As the dust built up on the solar array, that power went down and down and down and down. When this picture was taken, it was about 250 watt hours. And death is somewhere around 150. So spirit was close to the end. Then one wonderful day, this happened. Lucky Gusman would hit the vehicle, clean the solar arrays off, and overnight it went back up to 850 items. Pure dumb luck. It was as if this had happened. In reality, here's what's, what happen what's, what's happening. Check this out. Look at that. Dust devils. Little Martian mini tornadoes that go whirling through the scene. I'll play this again. It's a great little video clip. You can almost see Dorothy and Toto flying through the scene. Check this out. What was that? Eclipse. Very good. Eclipse. Mars has two moons, the names of Phobos and Deimos, they're tiny little things. This is Phobos passing in front of the sun. This is the first solar eclipse ever witnessed from the surface of another planet. There's no science in this at all. We just did it because we could. 
And this is the sunset on Mars because of all the reddish dust in the atmosphere. The sky is pink in the daytime, and it turns blue at sunset. It's the opposite of Earth. All right, let me now talk about opportunity. We chose the landing site for opportunity, not because of the topography, but because of the chemistry. The picture on the right shows data taken from orbit. The blue stuff is boring old lava. The red stuff is the mineral hematite. Hematite is an iron oxide. It's a mineral that's found in rust, and it sometimes forms as a result of the action of liquid water. So this was like a chemical beacon visible from space saying, hey, come land here. Water may have been here. Now you can see at the lower left, this is a very flat, smooth landing site. It's good for landing. But I was nervous that nowhere would we find the topography that we needed to expose some bedrock. Turns out I need not have worried. These are three of my favorite pictures from the whole mission. The picture at the upper left was taken, the three frames there were taken by our lander as it was descending towards the surface. There was a picture, there was a camera mounted on the base of the lander looking down. We snapped off three pictures. If you look carefully, you can see there's a crater. And just to the left of the crater, down a little bit, there's a little black dot. That black dot is the shadow of the parachute. Okay? And then above the lower right, you've got the same scene just projected um, obliquely. Now, the red curve shows the reconstructed trajectory that our spacecraft followed as we went through the landing process. So we're coming screaming in from space, going about, oh, two, three hundred miles an hour. We fire the retro rocket, zero out the velocity, inflate airbags, fall to the surface, and the airbags start to bounce. The wind that afternoon on Mars was blowing from the south. So the trajectory bends to the north, bounce, 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 and then reading the green perfectly, the trajectory bends to the left, it goes right into a little 20 meter diameter impact crater. <laughs> Tiger Woods on his best day <laughs> could not have pulled off this landing again. It was just pure dumb luck. We opened our eyes, and there was this spectacular outcrop of layered bedrock right in front of the road. Now, when we landed, we didn't know how big the crater was or how far away the bedrock was. And on the night that we landed, the name that my team gave to this massive outcrop was the Great Wall. That was what they called it, the Great Wall. Then we took some stereo pictures and did a little trigonometry. Little tiny outcrops, great big row, but the Great Wall was eight inches tall. <laughs> but, but its small size was part of this charm because it meant that that layering that we were seeing was very fine. Now, it was the hematite that brought us to this site, so we started looking for the hematite right away with our infrared spectrometer, and we made a map of it. Red is lots of hematite, blue is none. There's lots of hematite outside the crater. There's a little bit in the outcrop. And then on the crater floor, there are these splotches, shown in blue, where there's no hematite at all. Those are airbag bounce marks. We landed using airbags, like a giant beach ball, and when you bounce in the dirt at this place on Mars, for some reason, hematite, goes away. Here's a picture of the airbag bounce marks. And you can see, nice and smooth, no hematite there. And then in between, where there is hematite, it's kind of rough. That's where all that gravel is. So we're thinking, ah, the hematite must be in the gravel. We drove off the lander, and we looked down at the gravel. We started to notice that these grains of gravel looked off the ground. So we took out our microscope, and we took this picture. And I will remember, as long as I live, where I was standing, how I felt, and the unrepeatable words that I said when I saw this picture. The surface of Mars at this place is littered with an uncountable number of little round things. And they're four or five, six millimeters in diameter, and they're absolutely everywhere. We drove over the outcrop, and very quickly we realized that the little round things are embedded in the outcrop like blueberries in a muffin. And the blueberries are hard, and the muffin is soft, and the muffin erodes away, and the blueberries fall. And they're everywhere. Now, of course, by this point, we were desperate to know what the blueberries were made of. And this, this is a picture taken with a microscope that shows one of these little blueberries in the rock. But the single blueberry is too small for us to measure its composition. So what we needed was a gathering of blueberries. We found one. There was a place where there was a little bowl-shaped depression in the rock with a bunch of berries that rolled into. We call it the berry bowl. And we went over and we stuck one of our instruments inside of it. And what we learned was that, in fact, yes, these blueberries are made of hematite. What we came to realize was that the blueberries are what geologists call concretions. Concretions form typically in sedimentary rocks on Earth that are saturated with liquid water. And there's some mineral dissolved in the water that wants to precipitate out, finds a little nucleation point, 
and it starts to build, it starts to add layer upon layer, making a little hard spherical module in the rock, like the way an oyster builds a pearl. So again, this was compelling evidence that there was once water at this place on Mars. We left our little crater, we did some more exploring, and then we decided to embark on a long, long drive to the south. And as we went south, the terrain changed. And we started to come across these little dunes, these little ripples. And we got further south, and they became bigger and bigger, and soon there were little dunes. And we drove over them just fine. We'd go up one side and down the other. We drove over hundreds of these things. And then one day, we were driving along through this stuff, and we hit one of these things that was just a little bit different in some way that I still don't understand from all the others. The wheels broke through the crust. And we did 50 meters worth of wheel turns, thinking we were driving happily across the plains, when in fact we were just digging ourselves deeper and deeper and deeper into the soil. We came in the next morning, we had all six wheels buried over the hubcaps. It's a very bad thing. Now, the first rule of a situation like this is don't do anything stupid that's going to make the problem worse. Okay, the sun is shining on the vehicle, we got power, uh, it's not going anywhere, so we got time to work the problem out. When we built the rovers, we actually built four of them. It's spared an opportunity on Mars, but we have two more rovers back here on Earth that we can use to simulate predicaments that we've gotten ourselves into on Mars and try to figure a way out of it. Now, the thing that we needed in order to simulate this predicament was a very large quantity of fake Martian soil. Now, if any of you students out there are ever called upon to make fake Martian soil, here's the recipe you should use. It's equal parts play sand, the stuff you use in kids' sandboxes, clay, and diatomaceous earth, the stuff you use in swimming pool fields. So once we worked out this recipe, a bunch of engineers and pickup trucks spanned out across the LA basin and bought up literally tons of these three ingredients. People were getting algae in their swimming pool all summer long <laughs> because of us. We brought it back to JPL, we mixed the stuff up, we made mounds and pits, and we drove the rover into it. We spent two and a half weeks rehearsing, trying to find the optimal way to extract a robot from a sand dune on another planet. There are a lot of things you can do. You can steer the wheels back and forth, you can rock the vehicle. Um, after two and a half weeks, we found the optimal technique. The optimal technique, it turns out, was to put it in a reverse and gun it. Um, <laughs> there's no place you go to look this stuff up. So here we are, found it on Mars. This is horrible. And there was a left where we were really stuck. It was a mess. Anyway, after six weeks stuck in a feature we later came to call Purgatory Doom, <laughs> uh, one wonderful Saturday morning, the vehicle popped out, and we've been treating those dunes with much greater respect ever since. Uh, this shows how things stand right now. Um, where we landed was near, you can see at the very upper left, a place called Endurance Crater. We drove six kilometers south from there, about four miles to Victoria Crater, which you can see there. Uh, opportunity right now is where that red X is, having driven about 24 kilometers, so roughly 15 or so miles over the course of this mission so far. Our goal is Endeavour Crater. 15 miles across, this thing is huge. If we can get there, it's going to be like the mission starting all over again. Will we get there? I have no idea. Well, we're 2,400 days into a 90 day mission, so what the hell, we're going to try. <laughs> um, this picture on the left came down a couple days ago. Uh, the picture on the right came down just a few hours ago. Uh, we have come across a stretch of bedrock that has what looks for all the world like mud cracks on it. Pretty interested by this, so we're uh, making some measurements right now. Uh, whenever I talk about the Rover Project, I always end my presentations with this slide. Um, I wrote a book about the project called Roving Mars, and in an appendix of that book, uh, I made an attempt to list the names of all the people who work on the project. There are more than 4,000 names on that list. I am just one of them. I feel like I'm accepting this wonderful award on their behalf. Here are a bunch more of the guys. This is uh, at Cape Canaveral. This is the night that we sent the opportunity the spacecraft out to the launch pad. You can see the, the spacecraft in the background there. Um, for every one of us who has had a remarkable experience being part of this mission, 
it has been in the literal sense of the phrase, the adventure of a lifetime. And I want to thank you very, very much for inviting me here to tell you about it and for this wonderful award. Thank you. So Squires for that incredible presentation and uh, I feel like I've just been on the surface of Mars, don't you all think so? Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> and thank you for accepting the honor of the Mines Medal and for your except exceptional contributions to science, engineering, and technology. You know, generations to come will benefit from your research and discoveries, and we all thank you very much. Before concluding, I would like to personally thank the staff in my office, Heather Hoffert, Beth Riley, and Sharon Dominic, the staff in the Office of the University and uh, University in Public Relations, and Mines Dining managed by Aramark for all their efforts in preparing for this event. Let's give them a round of applause. Finally, thank you all for joining us this evening in celebrating landmark scientific and engineering achievements and for supporting a brighter future for School of Mines students. We hope that you will also join us next year for the third Mines Medal Awards ceremony. Let's now ask our MCs, Jack and Julie, to return to the stage and close our program. Give a round of applause. You did a great job. Well, we've done nothing compared to Dr. Squires, but we'll just leave that. <laughs> Please join us one more time in truly congratulating Dr. Stephen Squires. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and remain standing for the retirement of the colors. Our OTC color guard, please retire the colors. And thank you again to all the guests and the wonderful supporters of the Mind Metal. Have a great evening.